So I recall sitting in my high school geometry class asking myself, why in the world do I need to know the Pythagorean theorem? You may have had a similar experience in your high school geometry class. And the reason for that is because we are the inheritors of a very ancient way of doing education known as the liberal arts. The Greeks and Romans invented this way of educating. They had two parts, the trivium and the quadrivium, the trivium being grammar, logic, and rhetoric, and the quadrivium being arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. And the point of all of that was to teach students language, to have them engage language, to teach them to read great stories of great people, to shape them, and then to expose them to the sciences and to the arts and send them off to change the world. I'm asked all the time about what's more important, technology or a liberal arts education? And I think that shows a misunderstanding about what a Christian liberal arts education is. See, in reality, it's not either or, but it's both. We are people who have minds, we are people who have hearts, and we are people who have hands. And what a Christian liberal arts education actually promises is to know not just what to do and not just how to do, but whether one ought to do it. You see, while true education does aim at the mind and at the heart, True education can only happen after the heart has been changed. Christ changes our heart so that we might know him and then might know his world properly. So Christian liberal arts education completes what the Greeks and the Romans started by changing the heart first and then changing the mind so students might live lives of wisdom, compassion, and courage. At the Bear Creek School, we're trying to do that, to create students who are wise, compassionate and courageous, who have the goods of the mind to be able to engage the world, but who also love their neighbor as themselves and have the courage to step out and to make a difference in the world. As you've already heard graduates, we implore you, be heroic, live courageously and make a difference in the world. Always remember, fairy tales are more than true, not because they tell us that dragons exist, but because they tell us that dragons can be beaten. Well, welcome to our event today for Tools for Success and how to prepare your child for kindergarten. I'm Rachel Urban, I'm our preschool division head, and we hope you enjoyed that intro. Um, whether you are a current family at the school or you are just checking us out, feel free to look at our website more for information about our school. Uh, but before we begin, I'm going to open us up in prayer and then I'm going to introduce our speaker today. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for this time. I pray blessing over our event right now. I pray you'd be in the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart. And Father, I thank you for the precious gift of children. Um, just be in this time and help parents um, be able to walk away with just more information to come alongside their child. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you guys again for joining us. Um, I am excited to present our speaker today. Um, Karen Blankenbeckler is our VP of Academic Affairs at our school, and she is an amazing wife and a mom of four. And she is going to just bring some great information for you today to how to prepare your child for kindergarten. And so with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Karen Blankenbeckler. Thank you, Rachel. I'm really excited to join with you all today. Thank you for being here with us. And I get the privilege in my job of working with the preschool all the way up to um, our seniors and our graduates. Um, but my first love was early childhood education and, um, and my area of concentration in my training was in early childhood education and my first role at Bear Creek was teaching kindergarten. So I have a lot of passion for this topic and I'm glad that you joined us today and we're just going to share some things with you that we've learned um, over the years of working with children this age. And then we hope that you will um, ask questions. So we're going to um, go ahead and field questions throughout the presentation. If you put your question in the question box, um, we'll take time to answer them as we go. So don't feel like you have to wait until we're finished. If a question pops into your mind, feel free to just put it in that question box at any time and we'll try to get your questions answered. We're going to go ahead and start off with a little practice using the question box and actually a way for us to get to know you a little bit better. Um, so if you would put in the um, question box 
how old your children are. That would really help us to know who's um, listening in today. So go ahead and do that now. Um, just type into that box the ages of your children. That would be fantastic. We'll take just a minute to let you do that. All right, um, go ahead and do that at any time and we'll just kind of keep watching um, to see what comes into that question um, box and what age your children are. That would be helpful. Um, we're going to talk today about kindergarten readiness and but some of the tips that we're going to share for you um, could be valuable um, no matter the age of your children. They're for they're for early childhood, but some of these things may apply even if you have a child who's not entering kindergarten next year and um, as you heard in the video from Mr. Carruth, we really want to view children as whole people. They are heart and mind and soul and body, and we want to shape all of those. And they're all related um, in their kindergarten readiness. So we're going to start off with um, social emotional um, and talk a little bit about that. And then we're going to move to some of the more academic or cognitive topics. So that's kind of where we're headed today. Um, so um, on the social end, that is a, a really important thing to be developing at this age. And um, some of you have children who have separation challenges. They have trouble leaving mom and dad or don't necessarily want to be away from you. Some of you do not. Your child separates very easily and is happy to um, be in the presence of others. But it's something to kind of pay attention to as you get ready for kindergarten or formal schooling um, if you haven't done that um, much in the past. So some things that can really help students get ready for a new environment and adjust um, are to schedule play dates um, with especially to get to know some of the students that they may be in school with um, or in these times of COVID where you might not be ready yet to um, have your child interact with other children. Even just play dates where they're around family members and you're not um, always present but they're learning how to interact with other children um, can be really helpful. Um, doing lessons or classes can help them get used to interacting with other children and then um, if you haven't left them alone taking an opportunity to possibly leave them with a friend or a relative um, while you go away can help um, quite a bit with that um, separation we do um, back to school events at bear creek that the children get to come to campus and see their environment and interact with their teacher um, and those sorts of things can really help a lot um, with getting them ready to socially um, be ready to back um, be be entering school um, one of the things that is important for school readiness is that also that they know how to navigate social relationships. Um, it's, it's one of the things we teach once they come to school. It's part of our character development program in both um, preschool and um, kindergarten. Um, but as you get them ready for kindergarten, there's some things that you can do. Um, so it, whether it's in your household, with siblings or relatives or on a play date, it's a really good idea to intentionally train them. And the three we have listed here is on sharing, on using kind words and on manners. And so I'll give you a little example of what that might look like. So let's say you're getting ready to um, interact with a friend or a cousin um, and you're working on sharing with your child. So some ways that you can really intentionally work on that is just to set them up for success before they're in the presence of that other child by saying, uh, when we go to visit, um, your friend John or your cousin John, I want you to practice sharing. And what that's going to look like when we're there is if there's a toy that you would both like to use, you're going to practice saying, here, you use it first and I'll take a turn after you. Um, and 
uh, it's a really good idea to model some of these things together with them and practice them at home before you have that social event or that social engagement, because those are some of the things that we will want them to know how to do when they come to school. Using kind words is another one and practice those, practice saying things like, um, I'm thankful that you had me over to your house or um, that was nice of you to give that to me or I like the way you um, played with that toy or I like the thing that you built. Um, that it sounds kind of funny to literally practice those things, but modeling it, training them to actually speak those words out loud, and then taking that next step of speaking them to a friend um, can really encourage their social um, readiness to enter school. Having good manners um, is, is a really important part of that process as they begin to build relationships with other students um, and with the adults in their life. Um, so those are some of our social emotional um, readiness ideas. Um, we're going to move on to some other um, emotional things that you could do. And before we move on to those, um, Rachel Urban has a couple things she wants to share with you on those on that same topic. Hi there, and Karen, I just love what you said about modeling um, that with the kids and practicing that because um, in a time I think with the pandemic, I, I've had I've heard that a lot from parents about being concerned with their kids coming into a social environment. And so you can use like little stuffed animals again to practice that or at the dinner table. So I love that. And then I also just want to say too, we find that separation anxiety, again, just want to calm people with that, that that is really common in the threes. Um, and then once they're getting to that five, we see that less and less. So prepare, preparing them for kindergarten um, and even into our fours, we see that less um, happening with the separation anxiety. Um, but even front loading some of that before they start school about what to expect, because oftentimes we do just put kids into an environment and go, ta-da, you have to figure that out. And so for, um, front loading that by giving them words and saying, we're going to be going to school in a couple of weeks and this is what's going to happen and I'm going to leave you all those different things can help prepare a child too. So I just wanted to add, add that on as well. Thanks Rachel, those are really helpful. Um, so the next area we're going to talk about is getting them emotionally ready and the first area and that is um, building up their responsibility. Um, so as parents, we can fall into the habit of doing things for them. Um, often it's because it's more efficient and it's just easy for us to do. Um, and uh, a lot of times, you know, we're in a hurry or it's just we don't even think about it. We just go ahead and take that task on um, instead of asking them to take that task on. So as they're preparing for kindergarten, um, building up their responsibility is really important because there will be certain things that they're expected to be able to do on their own in kindergarten. So um, simple things like hanging up their coat um, when they get home from something, knowing where it goes and expecting them to walk over and hang it up and have that be a routine that they do is really helpful for building responsibility. We see sometimes, you know, kids arrive at school and they hand their coat to dad and dad hangs it up for them. So if you can begin working on some of those things even now where they learn to take care of their own materials, um, those are really important. Um, carrying their own bag, tying their own shoes, putting their own things away, even just kind of um, starting a routine of things have their place and it's your responsibility to put things back um, in their place when you're done using them. Um, so think about some of those that you might be able to build into your at-home routines as you teach them to be more and more responsible with their things. Um, the next one on um, emotional readiness is developing self-control and we understand this is developmental and um, as we grow in age, we grow in self-control, but there are things that you can do to help that development and to help them um, continue to increase their self-control. So interrupting is a big one at this age. Um, they, they want to be heard and they want to be heard now and they they don't have as much patience um, to wait at this age, but building up 
their endurance and being able to wait and building up their self-control of not interrupting is really important. A little technique um, that can be really helpful in this, and um, I'll let Rachel share some strategies she's seen in a minute, but one technique that we found really effective is if, if they really have something they want to say to you and you're busy, let's say you're on the phone or you're um, in the middle of another conversation, if you teach them a signal, perhaps they come up, they put their hand on you and they wait. Um, you will need to acknowledge they have their hand there and sometimes you might say, oh, thank you so much for letting me know you have something to say. Wait just a minute and then I'll get to you. Um, or you may um, just know they have their hand on you and after a few moments say, oh, thank you so much. Did you have a question or something you wanted to tell me? Um, those are really good um, strategies for them. It delays their um, needing your attention immediately and teaches them self-control as they, they learn to wait and they learn to be a little bit patient. Um, uh, you will know your child and how long waiting is appropriate for them. Um, when you start off, you don't want to make them wait for very long because you're trying to build up that endurance. You're trying to build up that self-control. So in the beginning, if they can't wait, you know, get to them pretty quickly um, and, and reward them for even just waiting. You know, I put my hand instead of just saying it, but I got to them right away. Um, so you, you want to build up their self-control, um, not expect them to have it all right from the beginning. Um, controlling impulses is another one to keep working on, um, and that's just um, waiting. Um, don't say it until you've thought about it, or I know you want to do that, but we're going to wait just a minute and then we're going to go. Um, all of those things begin to build up. Some of you have children who were born with self-control, and this really isn't a challenge for them. If it isn't a challenge for them, then it wouldn't be something you necessarily have to pinpoint to work on. But if you know your child can be an interrupter or does have a little bit of difficulty um, controlling impulses, that would be something you would want to work on prior to kindergarten. And then the last one is really respecting physical space. Families have um, different family norms. Some families wrestle with each other and are rough and tumble. Some families are more touchers or huggers or um, and then some families aren't as much. Um, in school, we are going to ask children to really respect other people's physical space. It, it, you know, we don't wrestle at school. We don't run up and push someone at school. Um, we, we need to stay within our own boundaries and understand our own physical space at school. So beginning to practice those things at home um, and beginning to teach your kids how to do that with you and their siblings um, or friends and relatives can be really helpful practice for them with school. We really recommend with some of these strategies that we're um, sharing with you, Take one at a time that you think is the most important for your child to work on. They can't be working on everything at once. Um, so just, just pick one that you think is the next one that you're going to be pr begin practicing and working on, um, especially if it's a real challenge um, one for them. Rachel, is there anything else you wanted to share on that or do we have any questions? Uh, no questions yet, but thanks for everyone to just posting um, your children's ages. It's fun to look at all the different ages and um, where people are at, but just a couple of things with self-control too and just the social emotional is I think for kindergarten readiness, oftentimes we do look a lot at people look at the academics and just focus on the academic piece and I just want to encourage people again that the social emotional piece is just as important. Um, if if not, you could even say even more important too. And sometimes that's harder for us to wrap our minds around, um, especially if we're looking for those check boxes of, of things that we want our kids to get to. So again, as Karen just explained, that self-control piece really is important too in self-regulation. Um, I posted in the chat one of our P5 classes um, because they focus on self-control to um, create a chance and I wrote that chant in there. And then just a quick little phrase you can say for self-control.
control with your student with your child at home is I make myself do the right thing. Um, so with self control, you um, you can encourage your children. Um, do you need mom and dad to say that to you? I bet you can um, make that choice and you can make that wise choice so you can make yourself do the right thing. You don't need me to help you um, do that right thing in that moment too. So that's that's another little phrase. But um, there's a other phrase I posted in the chat too. Um, for P5 um, teachers that um, came up with this. Thanks, Rachel. We're going to uh, move on to some of the um, more academic skills and academic knowledge things that we look for in getting ready for kindergarten. But um, first, we want to talk about just some general principles as you approach these things. And we want our, we want kids to realize that learning is enjoyable. The Lord made us to be learners. He He made our brains to want to know things, and and we want to encourage that as the adults in their life. Um, so when you think about engaging in some of the activities with them, we want to really make learning fun. That does not mean there aren't things in life that are rewarding and needed that are just plain old hard work and we have to practice them. Um, so we definitely need to take those things on. We don't want our kids to be afraid of hard work or effort or things that are challenging, but you want to balance that with um, their general outlook on learning and make sure we're going to tackle this hard thing because we need this skill and then we're going to do some something fun with learning um, and make sure you're approaching it in a really balanced way. Consider your child's natural temperament. What are their natural interests? What do they love to do? Um, if they're if they're really physically active, I had a son who to work on some of these academic stuff, we had to be moving. He could count like crazy when we were on the swing. He could work on his alphabet letters while we were tossing a ball back and forth in the backyard. Um, he was just one of those kids who thought would think better when we were moving. Um, so think about some of those things of what your child naturally enjoys um, and, and kind of capitalize that. And then um, keep celebrating their strengths, who they are, how the Lord's made them, um, and give really genuine specific praise in this process. Um, and then, you know, when we have stressed parents, we have stressed kids. So if you're really stressed about their um, learning and focusing on their learning and helping them get certain skills, it will cause stress in your child. So try to find ways to do it in a way that's relaxing and enjoying to you as well so that you're creating that time with your child that is really enjoyable for you and for them. So let's jump into um, some specifics. Um, Rachel had something she wanted to share before we move on to find motor skill development. And when um, we had one question in the chat, Karen, and Audrey had posted, I have a child whose love language is quality time and physical touch. Although they may not need the help getting dressed, they often ask for help. Do you have recommendations for autonomy? And I love that question um, and just thinking through that. And I'll let Karen answer that too. I thought of one thing as I was reading that, Audrey, that you can start off by saying, um, I'm going to pick what your shirt today and you get to pick your pants. So it helps them start to bridge that gap and um, start to make those choices. So you can just pick out one one of those pieces and then tell them um, I'm going to let you're going to get to choose the other one. Um, so that's just one um, suggestion there. And I don't know if Karen would like to share any other thoughts she has on that as well. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. I love that you're reading about love languages. So I'm going to tell you a little bit, a, a, a little story related to that with my son. He's um, he's now he he graduated from Duke with a biomedical engineering degree, and um, and so you get a, he he turned out okay. I guess is my point. <laughs> but um, when he was um, that the age of your children. He his love language was acts of service. And so I made his lunch every day and some families would say, oh, make them have the responsibility of making their own lunch. But literally that was love in a bag for my child. It was the most loving thing I could do for him to make his lunch. I found other ways to teach him responsibility. I didn't do everything for him. I just knew that that one thing was going to be something really special I could do for him. So 
And in answer to your question, Audrey, if, if a big piece of loving is helping her get dressed in the morning and helping her get ready, then maybe you shower her with love by doing that together with her. And then just look for other ways that you're helping her take responsibilities on. So we, we can balance these things out. And I think that's really wise that you're thinking about ways to care for her in her own love language. So good job. Yeah, I love that answer, Karen. That's beautiful too. Thanks for that example. Um, all right, so with fine motor skills, um, that is one of the things that um, are part of what they're working on through the preschool years and then um, continue in kindergarten. But much of it is developed um, before they enter kindergarten. So if you have a preschool age child, you can really um, help shape this. They're in school some hours, but they're at home many more hours and working on their correct fine motor skills at home can really benefit them. Um, and so a few things that you want to work on is that they have correct pencil grip and um, you don't want them to squeeze it too hard um, because if they're squeezing it too hard, we find they tend to not like writing throughout because they're gripping it so hard that it can literally hurt their hand. So just doing some things with them where they realize it's really light, it's not heavy, and I don't need to squeeze it hard can help a lot. And then working with them on the correct grip from the time they're really little, this can be helpful when they first pick up their first crayon or their first pen or a marker or anything. Working with them on gripping it correctly and training that can be really beneficial. Once a child gets an improper um, grip and uses that grip for a long time or even just a year, they they um, it's really hard to undo the bad habit. So if you start off with that, that would be great. Um, some of your children love to draw and color and um, do that thing. Some of them probably really dislike that or they're just not drawn to it at all. They're kind of always off doing gross motor things and not that interested in fine motor. So those are the ones that are a little bit more challenging to find ways to help them be developing those skills. Um, you can print out color pages of special interest areas for them. Um, there's color pages all over the internet. You just need to Google it. Um, but that can help if it's an, an interest area for them. A whiteboard can really help because that flows a little smoother and easier. Um, and, and it's also just fun to interact with um, a little bit more than maybe pe paper pencil sometimes. Um, copying designs is um, something I would um, really recommend. It can work it can work when you're sitting in the doctor's waiting room, you're at church and you're trying to keep them busy because really all you need is a pen and a piece of paper. And basically the idea is that you just draw a squiggly design on the paper and then they try to trace outside um, and follow the curves and follow the shapes of whatever design you made. Um, and then you do the next layer and then they do the next layer. And really what you're working on is just them being able to control their pen, pen pencil, crayon, whatever you're using, and begin to notice shapes on the paper and try to get their motor skills to follow those things. It creates kind of a fun design on the paper and they end up really enjoying it in the process, especially if they're artistically inclined at all. They really like that kind of thing. Um, using a salt box, sandbox, um, those kinds of things, just taking a regular baking sheet, pouring salt in it and, and having them practice making letters, making shapes that can help with their fine motor skills as their finger is practicing making those more delicate motions. Um, and then last, I'm just going to share a little bit about correct letter formation because they will begin making letters at home. They might um, be just making the letters of their name. They might just be practicing making certain letters, but it's really important to begin now helping them shape letters correctly because again, once they have developed bad habits, it's really hard to undo those bad habits. So. 
Um, one of the things we want them to know is that line letters and line letters are any of our, our letters that start with a line. So um, a lowercase b would be an example of that. It starts with a line and we always we want to teach them that line letters always start at the top and go down to the line that they're sitting on. Um, a capital D would be another example. It's a line letter because we make the line first and then we add the, um, the curve shape onto it. So all line letters should start at the top and go down to what we call the baseline. If they're shaping it up, <laughs> try to reverse that habit and try to practice the shaping it down because um, if they shape it up their letters won't be correctly formed and they'll be frustrated when they go to make letters later and those habits get developed pretty fast um, and then circle letters we call the letters that begin with a curved shape um, so I'll give you another little example of my son Jace um, his name begins with J and those are that's one of the first letters he learned to write well, J's um, curve the wrong direction for what we want kids to do for their circle letter. So um, a circle letter, we want to start at about what would be if you looked at a clock, about two, the two on a clock, and we want them to go counterclockwise and connect with where they started because that's how our letters in the English language connect. They connect if we go that direction and then they're ready to connect with the next letter. Um, if they go um, clockwise, um, their, le their letters don't get shaped correctly and they're formed wrong and they always look kind of funny on the page. So the example I was trying to tell you with Jay says he learned J first and J goes the wrong direction. So I noticed as soon as he learned J, he started making all his circles backwards. He started making them counterclockwise instead of clockwise. So it took me a little like, whoa, let's practice. Let's practice going this direction um, and kind of had to retrain him on that a little bit. Um, uh, Rachel, anything else you want to add about fine motor skills or does anybody have any questions about fine motor skills? Feel free to put those in um, if you have questions. Those are really great, Karen. I was also thinking we have a list for you today um, that's in posted in the chat, um, a link for two resource pages. And one of those resource pages lists a couple of things with fine motor on there. And so um, you can look at those. We have a journal that we actually use in our P3 class, but um, you can use it with P4s or four-year-olds, five-year-olds, um, because in our kindergarten program at the Bear Creek School, we do do um, a lot of writing. They start to write um, stories um, and that we put in our young author and young artist fair. So this is a great um, little thing that you can do at home um, every day, have them jot down or draw what they did. So um, those are really good. And another thing is sometimes as Karen Karen said you have kids that don't like coloring so we have also found that maze books um, are a great way and um, so this is recommended in our resource um, page too with um, these Kumon maze books and you can progressively get harder and harder with these so um, that's also another um, part we have in that link and then we also um, recommend pencil grips like Karen said too. Um, we use a program handwriting without tears for our preschool program for our early threes and one of the things that was developed by an OT that curriculum was um, and one of the things in that research with um, that program is that even by the age of three they've already established pencil grip so don't panic and say, oh my goodness, they're already doing the wrong pencil grip, but um, you can correct those things and help them have that correct habit with it. Um, but buying a pencil grip can help establish to um, where their fingers are um, go. So we have that again in that resource page that you can um, download as well. Thanks, Rachel. That's really um, helpful. I love those concrete resources. Those are really helpful. I wish I would have had that maze book when my kids were little. <laughs> yes, they love they love the mazes. Um, so we're going to our last two topics are going to be um, developing emerging math skills and emerging reading skills um, and the readiness things that we would um, say are really good to work on um, at home. Um, in preparing for kindergarten. So we're going to start with um, the math um, skills and number concept development. And in our culture right now, there's a lot of emphasis on 
um, early reading skills and a lot of um, resources for parents on helping your child become a reader. Not as much emphasis on those early math skills and they're, they are equally important. And so we really want to emphasize those because um, we want our students to be able to think mathematically. And this is going to sound super simple, but it's profound the effect on your kids and that count objects every day. You cannot count too much with kids. And it's funny because um, one of our um, math curriculums, they interviewed the top 10 mathematicians in the world and what they said, what makes you such a great mathematician? And all of them said, I count all the time. I count everywhere I go. I'm always counting um, because there's something important about counting that helps our brain really deeply understand number and number concepts and associating objects with that concept of that number in our brain. Um, and so there's a lot of just everyday things that you want to um, help your students to count. So we're putting out the, the plates at the dinner table. You're getting two goals here. You're building responsibility and you're counting. <laughs> like it's your job to put out the five plates because we have five people in our family. So let's count um, one, two, three, four, five. Now how many napkins do we need? We need five. Let's count one, two, three, four, five. How many forks do we need? We need five. Um, so things like that are so good for them, just having them count. Anytime you appro approach a set of stairs, let's count the stairs as we go up. How many stairs are there here? Um, picking up toys, like we, we got a lot of Duplos out all over the floor. As we put them back in the basket, let's count how many Duplos we had out. Um, sorting things, um, shoe bins, coins, anything like that. Counting is really important um, to do. You want to count big numbers and you want to count small numbers. You want them to be able, begin to go, gosh, that was 30 steps. 30 feels like a lot. That was 10 steps. 10 steps doesn't feel like as much. Um, so you're trying to give them that, that really tangible feel for how much those things are. Um, we're going to um, give you a little um, a tip, a game that you can play with your kids that will help you know um, how what their number concept is and then talk to you about ways you can develop their number concept. One of the most important math readiness thing you could possibly do for your children is to develop their number concept. Um, so and what I mean by that is if each one of you closed your eyes and I said, imagine five things in your mind with your eyes closed, you could all do that. Um, and you and if I said now rearrange those five things, now put those five things into two different groups, you could all do that in your mind. And that's because you have developed the concept of how much five is. It's not just a number on a page to you. It's not just a written symbol. You understand the concept of five. And this is something that's really important to develop with children. Um, the first thing they usually develop is one to one correspondence, which means you can lay out some things and they can count it. They can point to each object and know that's a different item. And that's an important developmental stage as well, um, that they understand that each item is its own item and it each is associated with a number. Um, so if your child's in that phase where they're still learning their um, their one to one correspondence. You just want to keep putting objects out and keep having them count them. If they're beyond that, then number concept is really important. Um, and so here's how that would work. You can use any number of objects, but um, we like to do it with beans because it's easy to hold in your hand. Um, so imagine I hold out my hand and there's four beans in my hand. And so what you want them to do is how, how many beans are in my hand? Some children will be able to just look at it and know right away that's four. Some will need to literally point to it and count the four um, beans in your hand. Either one, you want them to do whatever they're developmentally ready for. And then you're, what you're going to do is you're going to take some of those beans and put them behind your back. And then you're going to say, well, I started with four. Now I have one in my hand. How many do I have behind my back? 
if they can say three, you have three behind your back. They probably have a pretty good concept of four, but you want to try it a few times. You want to do, now I have two in my hand. How many do I have behind my back? Um, if they can say, you have two behind your back, that means they have really developed the concept of how much four is um, pretty clearly. If they do not have the concept of four, they're just playing a guessing game. They'll go, ah, uh, you have 10 behind your back or you have one behind your back. They just really have no idea. They're just guessing. Um, so you can do that with each number that you're curious, um, how they've developed their number concept. We would hope for kids going into kindergarten to have developed the concept up to at least like the number five. Um, is what we would want them to have developed to enter kindergarten. If your child has not developed it up to the number five yet, don't panic. All these things can be worked on and developed. Um, it just means that you want to expose them more um, to that con those concepts and make sure they're building their number concept. It is one of the most important things. Um, I taught third grade and I could tell the difference easily between kids who had a strong number concept and kids who did not have a strong number concept. Um, imagine something like I, I was a third grade teacher, so they had to know like uh, the fraction three fifteenths is equivalent to what? Well, if they had a strong number concept of three, five and 15, they would know right away that that fraction was one fifth. If they did not have a strong number concept, they would have to go through some sort of rote mechanism to calculate the answer to that question. Um, so it's really important all the way through and we'd really encourage you to keep working on those things. Um, you can read counting books. You can use any objects in your home that they have fun playing with to develop this concept. So it could be beans, buttons, cars, Legos, blocks, toothpicks, anything that you're doing the, okay, let's count them. Now let's arrange them in a different way. Okay, let's count them again. Let's arrange them in a different way. My One of my sons was very artistic. So he loved anything that could be made into a design. So we would take like, let's imagine our number was seven. We would count out seven toothpicks and he would make a design out of those seven toothpicks. And then he would make another design out of those seven toothpicks. But we were counting them over and over and over. And he would see those seven in all different arrangements over and over and over again. And that's how um, kids begin to develop this concept is seeing real live concrete objects that they're counting over and over and over. Um, really important when you're developing this that they do it with concrete objects. It's much more powerful in our brain when we're doing hands-on concrete things and concrete images in our brain. Sometimes we're tempted to go right to what we call the symbolic, and that's where it's a picture of it in a book or it's on a computer screen. Um, that's a symbol of a, say an orange or a Lego or a toothpick. It's not the actual toothpick. So doing it at the concrete level is so much stronger in their brain. So we really encourage you to do concrete. There's nothing wrong with also doing it symbolic. Um, at some point they are ready for that and they'll begin doing it with the symbols, but just don't, don't gloss over the concrete stage because it's really important in their development. Anything you want to add with that number concept development, Rachel, or do we have any questions? Hi, no questions on that, but um, just a question about a handwriting thing that I addressed in the chat. Um, but one other two thing you can also do with just um, number identification. Um, there's some great games with Think Fun. Um, I have the, one of the word ones here, but and we list, I believe this on our resource page too, but there's a number recognition Zingo one, which is just a bingo fun game. Um, so that's a fun thing that you can do with your kids as well. So I'll pass it back to you, Karen. Thank you. And yeah, please do let us know if you have any questions. We're happy to answer them. Um, just go ahead and put it in there and we'll we'll get to it because um, we want to know what what you're thinking about and what's on your mind or specific challenges that you might be um, working on with your children or even ideas that you have that you would want to share. Um, feel free to put that in there as well. 
Um, so that's that's a little bit about math. We're going to move on to reading a little bit and um, start with phonemic awareness, which what we really want for um, um, students to be able to do about well through the preschool years and then as they enter kindergarten, this is a readiness thing um, would be that they recognize their alphabet letters. They understand the sounds that those letters make. They can hear the sounds in words and identify them. And then, of course, the next step with reading is to put those sounds together and read words. Um, so developmentally, to be prepared for kindergarten, we would want them to recognize letters and hear the sounds of letters. Um, so you can do you can work on that in a variety of ways. If your child is not yet associating a letter with the sound, um, we recommend you start with some of the most obvious that make a strong sound. So, and you can even hear it when you say the letter. So when you say the letter B, our lips come together when we say the letter and it makes a B sound. So those are easier for kids because they're literally feeling the sound when they say the letter. D is an example of that too. Our tongue goes up to the top of our mouth when we say D and we make a duh sound when we say D. Um, so that list we've um, spelled out there are the easiest for kids who are beginning to learn to associate a letter with the sounds. Um, if they're really good and they already got it, you say, what sound does a T make? And they can go T. Um, then you want to make sure they're hearing those sounds in words. Like what what sound do you hear at the beginning of the word frog? You want them to hear that. What sound do we hear at the end of the word frog? Um, do we know what those are? Um, so you want to point those out all around you. Um, you can um, make letter, letter um, books that have like that are filled with things that make that sound, what you're really going for it is for them to repeat the sound over and over until their mouth knows how that sound feels and their ears know what that sounds like. Um, so that's really what you're trying to emphasize. Um, and there's all kinds of games that you can play with that to make that fun. We all drive in our cars a lot in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and so car games are a great time to do it um, instead of being tempted to, you know, turn on a movie or something. Play, play some letter games with them or play some counting games with them. There's a lot you can do. You want them to be, begin to hear those sounds all around them. Um, but play a game like I'm thinking of something that starts with the letter P and it makes a p, p, p sound. I'm thinking of a pig. <laughs> can you think of something that starts with P? Let's see if we can name 10 things that start with P before we get to grandma's house. Um, so those kinds of games can be really fun. Or um, I spy with objects around them, like I spy a tree. A tree starts with t, t, t. What do you spy and what do we think it starts with? Um, so those are some fun games, but really the emphasis should be on um, feeling what the letter sounds like and hearing what the letter sounds like when we hear them in words. Um, Rachel, anything you want to add about phonemic awareness? Just that um, a couple of pages in that resource again, um, there's going to be some resources that also might be helpful with that. I love what Karen said um, and just describing how to develop that phonemic awareness. Um, and some of the other things we highlighted in here that you can also do that are some apps and some um, uh, movies that people have done, like Letter Factory um, is on one of the pages of video that goes through like letters and sounds. Um, a new one that someone just told us about, um, one of our current parents, and I was checking this out and really um, liking it too, is an app they did with their three-year-old, um, is Endless Apps, and it has the alphabet and word play um, in it and early reading. And again, to another thing just to um, for game wise is the Zingo because they also have an alphabet one and then they have an early reader one for creating short vowels. So um, I just wanted to um, also point those out too for those of you who are kind of going beyond the a letter identification and now going into early reading with short vowels. 
Thanks, Rachel. Um, so a lot of these things that we're telling you about, um, we do with the Bear Creek School. Um, we, we study brain development, child development, what's, um, what kinds of things they need at this stage. Um, really great though in these early years when the parents are partnering with us because you have them a great deal of time and we have them some of the time. Um, as they get older, they're gonna be in school more than they're with you, but right now um, they're, they're with you a good amount of time. So um, working on things at school and at home um, can be really helpful. And if you don't go to the Bear Creek School, your school may or may not take some of these approaches and this would give you the chance to enrich um, what's happening by making sure they're developing these things um, by doing them at home. So the last thing we want to talk about is um, the best way to build great readers is by reading a lot and helping them um, develop their comprehension skills. So some people think um, comprehension doesn't start until a child is reading words fluently, but we know that it starts even when they're very, very young and they're not reading independently yet. Um, so they've done a lot of research on what makes a great reader and what makes poor readers. And the main thing that they find is that um, students who are not good at comprehending what they read, are their brains are not doing certain things while they're reading. Their brains are um, tending to focus in on um, the less important things while they're reading or their brains wander while they're reading. So if you imagine, you know, your five year old curled up next to you and you're reading them a book, a student who is developing their comprehension strategies or has natural comprehension strategies, their brain is thinking while you're reading. They might be thinking, ooh, I wonder what's gonna happen next, or I remember a time I felt sad like that, or um, oh, that guy reminds me of somebody I know. So kids who are good at naturally comprehending, their brains are doing those things kids who are not developing comprehension strategies, they might be curled up on next to you and you're reading away and they're thinking about why the cat is curling over on its back on the floor or just, I'm so happy to be snuggled up here next to my daddy. Um, and they're not thinking about the book at all. Um, so one of the things that you can do to help with that is to um, ask them questions as you go that get their brain doing what we know brains need to be doing. And whether or not your child is doing it some on their own, um, it's still good to enrich that by asking them um, questions. So we give you some examples here of some questions you might wanna ask. Um, why do you think that happened? Or what do you think will happen next? Or how do you think they felt? Or how does that make you feel? Um, so these are, these are questions you can ask while you're reading. You don't want to kill the book by asking them constant questions. So sometimes we just want to read a book, delight in the book and not ask any questions. Sometimes we want to stop occasionally and ask a question. Um, if you ask too many questions though, the book won't be interesting and your child is not probably not going to want to read with you anymore. Um, one other little thing I noticed um, with one of my children who's extremely visual, he had to digest the illustrations before he could pay any attention to the words I was reading or he was reading. So what I found is if I would just open it up and start reading, I would be done with the page. He hadn't paid any attention to anything I was reading because his brain was still going, look at that little boy under that bridge in the picture. Why, why is he under there? What's he doing under there? <laughs> so his brain was just completely on the illustration while I thought he was paying attention to what I was reading. So, so that's another thing just to kind of, um, if you have one of those more visual children, really explore the illustration together. Do the like, let's look at the picture first. What do we think is happening? Why do we think that's happening? Um, anything jump out to you about that picture? And then you can even connect that with their comprehension about the words. If they're very, very visual, it will strengthen their comprehension by connecting the picture with the words. Um, so begin doing that now. 
um, that, that will really help them grow in their comprehension. If you get tired of all your books at home, which most of us who read a lot, I had four kids, so I've got many books memorized. Um, they'll visit the library. You can check out eBooks right now if you're not comfortable um, visiting the library that can um, be really helpful too. Um, and then choose a big variety of books. Some kids don't want to read um, fiction. They're just more interested in, I want to read a book about chucks. I want to read a book about frogs. Um, and so you, you still want to expose them to fiction, but make sure you weave in plenty of those books that they're naturally drawn to. So you want a big variety. Rhyming books are really good for kids this age um, because we want them to begin noticing word patterns. Um, and so rhyming books where they get to fill in the thing that they think it's going to be because it rhymes or pattern books where they begin to get the hang of it and it actually seems like they're able to read it on their own because they got the pattern down. Those are really good for them because they're experiencing words, verbalizing words and predicting patterns about our language and how words sound. Um, nursery rhymes are really good for this. Nursery rhymes are the beginning of poetry um, because they play with language, they have rhyme, they have particular words that sound good together. Um, don't get too caught up in the meaning of those nursery rhymes. You don't have to talk about why Humpty Dumpty fell off. You don't have to talk about why Old Mother Hubbard's cupboard is bare. Um, little kids don't care that much about the meaning. Um, they like the play of the language. They like the flow. There's a reason those things have lasted for generations and generations because they play with language in a really special way um, that delights our ears. So um, spend some time with nursery rhymes too. Um, and just try to establish um, reading times that both you and your child enjoy. Could be in the morning, could be midday, could be before they go to bed at night. Keep playing around with that till you find the time that really works well for you and your family. Um, I'm a lark. I'm not a night owl, which means I do my best in the morning. I'm more engaged. I'm more enthusiastic. I'm um, I'm I'm tired in the evening, so I wouldn't be um, if I were a, ch a child. I wouldn't be comprehending as well probably in the evening or ready to talk about books as much in the evening. Um, so think about your child, their temperament, and the best times of day that work for both you and them um, to do some of these things. Um, Rachel, anything you want to um, add about reading? And then um, I'll just kind of give some closing thoughts before you close out our time. Yeah, just thanks, Karen. All that was so great. And just a couple little things with the reading part, too, is for those of you that their kit, your kids are knowing their letters, they're knowing their sounds, and they're beginning to put those letters and sounds together to make those words. Um, we try really hard to stay heavy in short vowel because then it's helping them to develop and understand how to decode those words. So a short vowel word would be like cat. And again, um, those Zingo games, they have a short vowel one of building words um, for short vowel words. So that's like really good one. And then there's books again with that, um, as Karen was talking, reading a lot with your kids, reading a variety of books. And as you're developing the habit of having your child read, do it in small doses as they're starting to sound out a book. So we always like to separate these are dessert books and these are just delicious books that we're absorbing and, and reading. And now we have these practice books and just make it a short time at first when they're starting to read a the cat sat book um, because those are just training their muscle. It's not an exciting plot line. Um, you're just tra helping train a muscle in their brain of how to do stuff and you're slowly building that muscle so they can get bit, read bigger and bigger things. So just a word of encouragement on that. Um, as well. And again, we list some of those early readers in that resource one. Um, one of our favorites is actually the phonics practice readers, and you can get them in short vowel and then long vowel and blends and digraphs. And then we also list Bob books because they do have some of the short vowel and long vowels um, and go into blends and digraphs as well. Um, so just a little bit of those as well. So I'll pass it back to Karen um, to kind of finish out our time too. 
Thanks, Rachel. So yeah, thank you for spending time with us today. And one of the things I just really want to emphasize as we close is there's a really big range of typical development at this age. We have kids who enter kindergarten who are already reading novels. We have kids who enter kindergarten who are just ready to learn to begin to read. Um, and we just want to partner with you and give you tools that can help them grow in that development no matter where they are on that continuum. Um, and, and we see kids leap ahead. We see kids, you know, continue strong progress. And we just want them to keep continuing um, their learning and their growth um, in the right developmental frame for them. So um, what, no matter where your child is on those, those continuum, some of the concepts that we presented today would be really helpful for them. We don't ever not, we, we always need to be growing in our comprehension and our thinking skills and thinking about our thinking. And we always need to grow in our number concept development, how well we understand numbers and how they're interconnected. Um, so, so those are good no matter what the level, but thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoy um, this parenting journey with your child this age. Uh, we love working with this age because their brains are just so ready to learn and um, you can just watch like almost hour by hour um, their development and the things that they learn. Um, so we have a lot of fun with them. We hope you have fun um, enjoying this age too. And please don't hesitate to um, reach out if you have um, further questions or wonder about ways that you can support your child's development. We would be happy to work with you. So I think Rachel's gonna close out our session. Thank you again, Karen. We just really appreciate you giving us time and your wealth of knowledge. Karen, as you just got to hear, has so much wisdom to share with us and we're blessed um, by that. So thank you, Karen. Let me just go ahead and close us in prayer and thank you again for coming. Jesus, thank you so much for this time. I pray blessing again over um, everything that parents heard, and I pray that it would help them um, know ways to come alongside their child. And I pray again that you would just be with the parents that um, were able to attend. Just give them um, just your grace and your favor and just go before them um, as they steward these precious children um, that they're entrusted with. In your name we pray, amen. Thanks again for joining us. Have a great day.